I've recently been reading this book entitled Fortune's Formula by William Poundstone. It focuses on a number of figures who were involved in developing scientific approaches to gambling and the stock market, but I want to focus on one specific formula in the book because I believe that this formula has a special and very interesting connection to Constellation Dag and the Hypergraph. That formula is colloquially known as the Kelly Criterion, which is a bankroll management strategy in betting. There are a number of different variations of this formula. I want to focus on one variation, and that is the G max equals R variation. And I will go into greater detail in this video about what that formula means and how it has a very interesting connection. One of the key figures in this book is Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon was a prodigious genius, another unsung hero of the history of invention. So interestingly, I've talked about Buckminster Fuller in previous videos. Claude Shannon was also from uh, Michigan, just like Bucky. And Wyatt Melman Flock, the inventor of DAG, is also from Michigan. So collectively, I refer to these guys as the magicians from Michigan. And uh, Claude Shannon developed information theory. He published this paper called The Mathematical Theory of Communication. What prompted his thought process here was his work on the differential analyzer, which was arguably the original computer, which had both mechanical parts and digital parts. It was invented by Vannevar Bush, who is also arguably one of the inventors of the internet. He invented this thing called Memex, which is like the URL system, essentially, of the World Wide Web, where you have addresses for information, the semantic web. So... Claude Shannon was working on this computer and it took many, many hours to arrange the gears into the appropriate patterns for the relevant computations. And then the output would be a, a sort of graph that was drawn on a piece of paper. Then realized that it could be made a lot more efficient if they used electrical circuits rather than gears. Essentially, his insight was that you could represent states in electrical circuits. In other words, he encoded binary logic into electrical circuits. Now, this binary logic is known as Boolean logic and was originally invented by this Irishman called George Boole down in Cork. And it is a fundamental type of logic which involves various functors like and, or, if, then, modus ponens. And, and basically Shannon realized that computers could be made much more efficient if these states were represented in electrical circuits. And that was the origin of his mathematical theory of communication. The core of this paper was the idea of the bit. And this was originally something conceived of by William Tukey, but Claude Shannon sort of refined Tukey's definition of it. And Shannon's definition was that a bit is the amount of information needed to distinguish between two equally likely outcomes. Okay. So if you imagine these outcomes being held in superposition, when one outcome rather than another happens, you have learned one new piece of information and that is quantified in a bit. What was really key to the insight here was that the way communications were typically thought of was in terms of meaning, okay, with the telegraph lines that they were using back then. What they would do was in order to send more information over less bandwidth, they would use abbreviations, which meant that there was less of the communication channel being taken up. They would try to sort of boil messages down to their essence. And that way it was more efficient. So if you compare that to something like water in a pipe, right? You can't compress water. Basically the throughput of the water in the pipe is determined by the area, the cylindrical area of the pipe. You cannot compress that water down anymore. And if you want to increase the flow rate, you need to increase the volume of the pipe. But with Messaging, you didn't need to do it that way. You can compress messages. You can condense them down to their essentials without losing the meaning. And so that was the original approach to telecommunications. Claude Shannon's key insight in the information theory paper was that bits were not about meaning. He gave a statistical account of information. And in a nutshell, what he claimed is that information is surprise, okay? That information is about 
deviation from expected or existing knowledge. So if you already know something to be true, then you're not receiving any new information because it's not informative. And so this idea of data and bits formulated in terms of deviation from expectation, that statistical account is the key part of this paper. It's worth noting, by the way, that BIT, B-I-T, is a portmanteau, a, c a combination of the words binary digit. So what are the other insights in this paper? Well, Shannon's paper had two key insights that really surprised everyone. One of these insights was, was that it is possible through the encoding of messages to use the entire capacity of a communication channel. This was surprising because no one had come within an arse's roar of, of achieving this in the past. No conventional code, whether it was Morse code or ASCII or plain English, is anywhere near as efficient as the theory said it could be. To be able to use the entire capacity of a communication channel is like the definition of efficiency. It is using all available potential. The other major surprising insight from this paper was the fact that Shannon could leverage this theory to reduce noise in communication channels to an arbitrary degree. Um, and the key insight there was uh, error correction codes. Another interesting connection to the hypergraph, which also uses error correction codes, but I'm not going to, I'm going to cover that in a, a later video. Just to go on another brief uh, tangent here before we get to the Kelly criterion and how it applies to DAG. There's another interesting parallel with the state of blockchain's current development and Shannon's work in which he exploits the full capacity of a communication channel. So this idea, as I said, was very shocking to people. It was very surprising that communication could be this efficient. And many people sort of had their doubts and detracted from this idea. One of uh, Shannon's detractors was John Pierce of Bell Labs. And Pierce essentially said, why bother with this approach? Why don't we just build more cable, more computing power, and build greater infrastructure, telecommunication infrastructure? But John Pierce's take really was abandoned after Sputnik and the US space program because it costs so many millions to put a battery into space. And satellite communications had to make the best of this anemic power and this very limited bandwidth. And so Shannon's work prevailed on the idea that we should try to do more with less rather than just building more hardware. The parallel with blockchain here is that essentially there are many blockchains that hang their hat on vertical scaling, which is to say they are adding further computational power to their systems. And this is their methodology for overcoming things like scaling issues and optimizing their performance metrics, such as transactions per second. It allows, you know, blockchains like Solana to claim that they are scaling at the limits of physics. And whilst that sounds sexy and really cool, I doubt that that's the best methodology for achieving the throughput that we are going to need in this world in the future. The alternative, and what Shannon was also essentially suggesting was making proper use of existing infrastructure, right? Harnessing the potential of channels that we already have, but that we don't fully exploit because of our clumsy approach to communications. So the hypergraph does the exact same thing because the hypergraph can run on devices with trivial, you know, power like mobile phones and door foot traffic sensors and other devices like this. So again, this is harnessing the potential of all these devices, which is currently not tapped into. And so I thought that that was another interesting parallel here. One thing that's important to remember about Shannon's work and about why it's a continuation of Shannon's work is that the stakes are very, very high when you're dealing with things like military and national security infrastructure or anything space related. You really have to get it right because the consequences of getting it wrong can be catastrophic. And just this morning, I saw that Elon Musk was talking about Starlink reprioritizing cybersecurity. I'll post the tweets here. 
and saying that during the Ukraine conflict, there was some signal jamming, which they've resolved through updating their software. But this is really DAG's bread and butter. It is built with this priority, the priority of security, cybersecurity, and by extension, operational security in mind. That's why it's being used for JADC2 by the Department of Defense. So this is a sine qua non of a data network that is being used on such a grand scale. You can't afford to get things wrong and you have to make sure that that is at the forefront of your mind throughout the entire process of constructing this kind of network. Okay, so getting back to the scientific methods that this group used to crack gambling, this really began with Edward Thorpe. Edward Thorpe is another genius who worked with Shannon and he essentially decided that he was going to crack blackjack. And he wrote this book, Beat the Dealer, extending on the work of Roger Baldwin, where he developed a system of card counting and it made him an overnight success. He ended up then getting bored with that and moving on to the stock market, which he viewed in a similar fashion. He said you could apply some of the same methods to the market. And he wrote a book called Beat the Market with Dean Kasuf from UC Irvine. And they developed things like delta neutral hedging and essentially ways of getting an edge over the market, getting a competitive advantage. Because there was this idea at the time of the efficient market hypothesis, which is still pretty prevalent today, and this thesis says that the market prices everything in, it's perfectly efficient due to the actions of arbitragers. And so there's no way of gaining a competitive advantage. Eugene Fama and Paul Samuelson from MIT, who basically transformed economics from philosophy into engineering with like lots more mathematical theorems and precision, essentially. But this precision, it would seem, came at the cost of, you know, complexity and depth and nuance. So. So the relevant part of these scientific methods for our purposes is the Kelly criterion. So the goal of Kelly's criterion was to optimize your returns in the long run while managing risk and avoiding gambler's ruin. And the simple formulation of this formula is edge over odds. Edge being your competitive advantage over the market, like the inside information or a tip that you have over divided by the odds, which is the public pricing of the bet on the tote board. So this heuristically can be defined as the bet your beliefs approach. So to give you an example, like if there are eight horses in a horse race and you are 70% confident that one horse is going to win and 15% confident that the other horse is going to win and then 5% confident that another horse is going to win you distribute your bankroll accordingly, okay? So you put 70% on, on the horse you think is gonna win, and then 15% on the second most likely, and so on. So this is the bet your beliefs approach. This is the Kelly criteria. So to speak a little bit more about what edge means, in the context of gambling, it means if you have an inside tip that you're very confident about, and you know, your confidence is probably never going to be 100%, but the idea is that you modulate your bet size in accordance with the confidence and any ambiguity or doubt you have is called equivocation, which is uncertainty. So you modulate and reduce your bets in accordance with the uncertainty that you have. So Kelly formulated the Kelly criterion in a way that directly related it to Shannon's theory of information and specifically the bit rate in Shannon's theory of information. And this is what G max equals R signifies. Okay. So G is the gambler's bankroll. Max, the subscript signifies the maximum rate of return possible. And then the R stands for the bit rate. Okay. In Shannon's theory. Okay. So he showed that the maximum rate of return was equal to the flow of inside information, the bit rate. Some things to note about this formula are that first, the currency units don't matter, right? It's agnostic as to what currency you're talking about. It just depends upon the currency of the bet or the investment that you're engaging in. The second thing to note is that the time units 
also don't matter. It could be uh, your rate of return in a year, in a second, in a month. But the units on both sides of the equation do have to be balanced, like in any equation. Another thing to note here is that the inside information must pre be presented in the most economical form possible, while still conveying the relevant tip regarding the outcome of the bet or the investment. So if you get an insider tip that rambles on about various extraneous details that aren't relevant to communicating the outcome, then all of that extra information is not relevant. It's not relevant to this formula. The bit rate assumes that you're communicating only the information necessary to provide the, the tip regarding the outcome of the bet. In my view, this is what makes this formula so elegant. The tip must be conveyed in the minimum amount of information possible. And that minimum yields the maximum rate of return. So I think an example would be helpful here to convey exactly how this formula works. So if you imagine that there is an eight horse race, the most concise way of identifying one winning horse out of eight equally likely contenders is to use a three bit code. So assign a number to each of the horses, and then you just need three bits to identify the winning horse. If this three bit tip is a sure thing, then you can wager your entire bankroll on the horse that's been identified. So every dollar then bet on the winning horse would return $8, which is the maximum possible rate of return. In other words, you can increase your wealth by a factor of eight every time you receive three bits of information. And eight is equal to two to the power of three, where three is the exponent. And this determines how fast the gambler's wealth compounds. Something else to explain here is the base unit, which is two in binary notation. There are a few different explanations about why two is chosen, but basically it again relates to the binary logic because one bit is equal to the information needed to distinguish between two equally likely outcomes, yes or no. Therefore, when you learn the outcome, you have gained that amount of data. You have a yes regarding a particular outcome and a no regarding the alternative outcome. So if you think of this in terms of a coin flip, there are two possible outcomes, heads or tails, and you need only one bit of information to convey the outcome. Therefore, the exponent in that case is one and the base is two, meaning in terms of the gambler's return, you double your money if you bet your full bankroll on the correct outcome. So to translate this formula into the language of Wall Street would be to say that one bit is equal to 10,000 basis points. This 10,000 basis points is 100% return, okay? So this sort of highlights the fact that this formula has a wider applicability than just gambling, but also investments. And in fact, I would argue even beyond investments to all sorts of games that we play in the real world. So let's, on that note, turn to how this formula applies to DAG or in the DAG and hypergraph context. So my claim is that Constellation DAG and the hypergraph are this formula in technological form because the hypergraph is all about verifiable information flowing at the maximum bit rate possible. What you have is truth, i.e. inside information, flowing at a massive scale, unprecedented scale in history. There's never been anything that has even purported to have the capacity that DAG has in this regard. So how is this formula specifically related to the hypergraph? Well, the pro consensus provides validation of the data that's flowing through the hypergraph. So you don't run the risk of Chinese whispers distorting the content of the message. You also don't run the risk of fraud. You can be confident that the information is getting through securely and that it is true as it's being pushed through the network. Also, the information is read by state channels, which provide this end-to-end -end security. 
So state channels solve the Oracle problem because they are directly connected to the information source and validate information at origin, right? So this resolves problems with human agents who might misinterpret information sources or might misperceive them or make errors in judgment. State channels are much more reliable. And so you have an even greater confidence in the nature of your insider information. Here, the data that is being fed into the hypergraph network. Another thing here to note that's really interesting is that normally when you get a tip, right, it's sort of a one-off thing. You are getting a tip about a particular game, a particular gamble, and you're being told in this instance that it's going to go one way. But with the hypergraph, you aren't just getting a tip. You actually own the whole network through which the tips flow. This is a totally different proposition. You have a basically recursive mechanism that provides all of these tips to other parties who may have an interest in them. And this is a much more potent type of thing. It means that you sort of are getting a cut from all of the insider information, which is leading to all of those compounded returns. Another thing to note here is that when we're dealing with the hypergraph, we're dealing with a much wider range of games than just gambling and investments. For example, we're also dealing with national security, which is, of course, of extreme value. But also, because it's data and complex data types that are flowing through the network, the tips can be much more sophisticated in a sense, right? They can be more nuanced and provide, you know, in more complex cases, more complex information as required by the game in question. Okay. So to clarify that a little bit, if you go and you have a horse race with eight horses, the outcome is just conveyed as one of the horses out of eight. But if you have something like a battlefield strategy, where it's a multivariate problem, where there's so many different factors to be considering at any given time, DAG accounts for that through its architecture. And nonetheless, it still constitutes insider information, even if it is more complicated. But also something important to note is that truth is subject to time decay, right? So something that is true at one moment might not be true at another moment, particularly if you're sending a communication at one moment, it might cease to be true in the course of it being transmitted in the interim. This is why it's so important that DAG can transmit data instantaneously. It handles this problem. It basically enables you to be sure that the data is correct when it's received, it's still correct. And so this enables you to convey things in real time, essentially. Also, something to note about the hypergraph and how this formula applies is that each individual tip can be relevant to many games at once. There can be a one-to-many mapping. This is unlike, say, receiving a tip about a, the outcome of a game, which is only relevant to that game. In the case of the hypergraph, you might have tip information data a truth that is relevant across many different sectors of the economy or other domains. And so, again, the fact that the hypergraph enables greater complexity of data means that you can have more nuanced information, which, which has you know, greater scope of applicability. And so one bit of information can be very valuable to many parties. And so you get paid, you know, by a factor of the amount of parties that find that tip relevant. So that's another interesting way in which the hypergraph sort of builds upon this formula. Another thing to note, which I meant previously in this video, was that the stakes can be a lot bigger here. You're not talking about only gambling and investments, but things like national security. And finally, to note how this formula is connected to DAG is that the hypergraph has infinite throughput, which means infinite bit rate, which means infinite returns. Um, you know, this is obviously a theoretical maximum, but it applies nonetheless. So that's really the end of this video. I don't want to make it too long. Thank you very much for watching. I guess something to note is that this video is itself insider information in a sense, because this is the truth about a truth network. So it's meta information, meta data. Uh, and so hopefully you will find it useful if you put it into practice.
Um, this isn't financial advice and it shouldn't be construed as such. Typical disclaimers there. But I do hope you enjoyed. Please take some time, if you have it, to read the paper I recently published called There's Something Special About Constellation Dag, the Hypergraph as a Global State Attractor, um, where it outlines my view of where Constellation Dag is evolving uh, in, and where it will ultimately lead to. So thank you very much for watching and have a good one.